everybody! Did you know there are only six people in the entire world that have been to every single San Diego Comic-Con since its start in 1970? What? And one of those people we have here on the show today, legendary comic book and animation writer, Mark Evanier. You're watching Allison's Wonderland, inside the world of animation and games. Hey, Mark. <laughs> Hi, Allison. It's so good to have you here. I, I, you've done my panel so many times, I feel I owe you a return visit. Oh, yes, welcome. Usually we're on your large stage at San Diego, San Diego Comic-Con with like 3,500 people, but today we're just in this tiny little studio. We're alone together. Yes. Except for the people running the cameras. You know, nobody yeah. needs to know All about right. them. All right. But... <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so, Mark, tell us a little bit about um, how you got your start working in animation. Uh, I did this backwards. Usually people go from animation to live action if they can. I went from live action to anime. I started actually in comic books. Okay. I started yeah. writing comic books when I was 17 years old. I apprenticed with a man named Jack Kirby, and if you don't know who Jack Kirby was, you have no business watching anything on YouTube at all. Uh, and I wrote Disney comics for years. I wrote the Bugs Bunny comics. I wrote the Scooby-Doo comic books. I segued into writing for stand-up comedians. I segued into writing TV situation comedies and variety shows. And at one point, I was working for Hanna-Barbera running their comic book division, mm -hmm. writing and editing those comic books. And I was writing live action shows for Hanna-Barbera. I didn't and even I, know they had live I, action Well, they shows. had a live action division at one point. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kept saying to Joe Barbera, I'd like to write cartoons. And he would say to me, oh, well, you're a live action writer. Live action writers don't know how to write cartoons. <laughs> and I'd say, I know more about your cartoons than anyone in this building, including you. And, what do you, what, and you said, showed him. And, and, and Joe said, oh, yeah? Okay, what's Wilma Flintstone's maiden name? And I said, Slag Hoople. And he went, I think that's right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so um, <laughs> anyway, I, I started writing cartoons. Slag Hoople, my maiden name as well. I, I started Slag Hoople, yeah. Allison Slag Hoople. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. A few people know that. All right, well, <laughs> secret's out now. Uh, and I started writing cartoons for a studio called Ruby Spears. Mm -hmm. We st I started writing ABC Weekend specials. I wrote Plastic Man for them. I wrote Thunder the Barbarian. And I went around working for every cartoon studio in town, except for the ones I sued. Uh, and, uh, Next question. <laughs> yes. And then um, I just, you know, you work for one studio and somebody calls you up and says, hey, will you write for us? And that's how it happened. Yeah. So how old were you? Were you fresh out of high school when you started? Uh, I started writing comic books when I was 17. I was, it was the so year I graduated high school. High school. Oh, wow. uh, and uh, I graduated in June of 1969 and made my first sale the first week in July. Oh, my gosh. And um, I've been fooling them ever since. So, <laughs> What did your parents think of your chosen career path? Well, there was a point in my life when I had to say to my father, Hey, remember how you thought I was wasting my time watching all those cartoons? Um, Hanna Barbera just hired me as a consultant to <laughs> pick all their cartoons out for home video, and I'm doing it from memory. So, uh, you know, it, it, it paid up. My father hated his job. My father had the worst job in the world. Mm. Uh, he was the person who had to come to you and say, uh, Ms. Packard, you uh, haven't paid your income taxes in a few years. We have to work on a payment plan or start seizing your assets. And everybody hated him. Oh, wow. Like he was a sweet man who just mm -hmm. hated that job, but he was just part of a generation that where well, you took a job to feed your family and that was what you did. And if, if you didn't like the yeah. job, too bad. So he used to say to me, please, whatever you want to do in life, pick, make, you can do anything you want as long as it's something you love. And, and it's I, not illegal. And I would say, I want to be a writer. And he'd say, do you have a second choice? <laughs> <laughs> because every writer he ever met was broke and owed the government a fortune. <laughs> yeah. But I began writing steadily, and he began to be excited about that. I think when he began to see my name on TV, mm. it made a lot of difference. Mm. Um, it sometimes helps to have a weird last name. Evanier, you Evanier, think it's weird? Yes. Yeah, it's, mm. Well, it's, it's one of those names, you know, the immigration department went, oh, here comes some Jews. Let's give them a really stupid last name. <laughs> um, but... Uh, it was, it's so unique. Mm -hmm. It's unique. And uh, so when he saw Evanier on the screen, you know, if, if our name had been Smith, 
big deal. You see Smith on the screen all the time. But uh, uh, that was that made a difference. And I was making more money than he was. And that made a difference. And <laughs> He didn't uh, have to come collecting for No, no. He didn't even have to sue me for not paying enough <laughs> taxes. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, it was fine. Uh, we had a very good, I had a very good child, I had good parents. Um, and, uh, you know, I grew up in West LA. Mm -hmm. Um, this will impress the hell out of a lot of people. The lady next door to us played Thelma Lou on the Andy Griffith show. Okay. And through her, I started meeting actors and people like that. And, you know, it's, she, she would, uh, uh, invite me over when she had company. And she, literally one time I was like 10 years old. She said, Oh, come over, Mark. I've got someone I want you to meet. And I walk in, I'm 10 years old. And I walk into her living room and she says, Mark, this is Betty Davis. Wow. And I, <laughs> and I knew who that was, yeah. which was even more impressive. What was going through your head at that time? I wanted her to see if she would come over next door, look at my room and say, what a dump. But um, <laughs> I, did, I was afraid to say that to her. Um, but you know, I, you know, so I grew up around show business. Mm -hmm. When I was about 12, they, she took me on the set of the Andy Griffith show and I played handball with Opie. Ron Howard. Oh, my and goodness. And met Barney Fife, Don Knotts. How and, old was uh, Ron Howard at that time? He was the same age as me, I think. Um, and uh, the kids are like. Know, and, and, I, and, I, and I just had little ways of running into people in show business and, yeah. and meeting them and like that. So I just kind of gravitated towards that field. Yeah. And so would you say, I mean, nowadays, nerd culture is so popular and so accessible to mainstream culture. What was it like back then um, in the late 60s, early 70s? Well, it was interesting because comic books, which I had more of than anyone in the world. Uh, For real? So, yeah. Oh, yeah. I had tons of them. I, <laughs> Guinness I, Book of I always had more than anybody I, I did. Uh -huh. um, sold better than they do now. But these yeah. days, everybody knows who Iron Man is. Yeah. These days, everybody knows who you know Shang Chi and and all the characters in the movies do, are and. Uh, but it was fun to feel like you were part of a little secret society that knew about all these weird comic books and cartoons and things <laughs> like that. And you know, if you can turn your passion into your career, that's a very good thing. Yeah. And it is amazing to me how. Uh, I used to think that I was qualified to win a lot of money on a game show no one would ever invent. <laughs> but I remembered... Whose comic is it anyway? That's right. <laughs> but I remembered an awful lot of stuff. You know, when I uh, my agent sent me out one day to meet Sid and Marty Croft, who had done all the oh, wow. HR Puffa stuff show. Yeah. And I knew everything about every one of their shows. which And, and they hired me. So, oh, and what, so, what did they hire you to work on? Uh, the first show I worked on for them was called The Croft Superstar Hours. Oh. It starred the Bay City Rollers before they were the unbelievable successes they are today. S-A-T-U-R-D-A-Y. Right. And then I worked on all their shows for about 10 years. I did all the wow. variety specials for them and, and things like that. And, uh, and Marty Croft would do this to me every time. We'd have a guest star. Like literally, he'd say, okay... Uh, Mark, uh, Mark, I want you to meet Bob Hope. Uh, <laughs> Mark knows everything about you, Mr. Hope. He will tell you everything you ever want. And I go, thank you. Put me, he put me on the spot. And <laughs> I put have, you on the spot and make you look like a stalker. That's right. Yeah. And it was, it was frightening. <laughs> um, and, uh, but we were, I got to work with that generation. Mm. I was, you know, we're going to talk about cartoon voices here, obviously. Yeah. And I am very proud of the fact that I got into the field in time to work with Mel Blanc and Dawes Butler and June Ferre and Don Messick and all the people who, on whose cartoons I grew up on. And you were very close with June. June, very close with June. I, I Every time I met co-wrote her autobiography with her. Mm. And June was amazing. She was, I, I took her to the daytime Emmys oh. when she won her first uh, Emmy Award. And what year was did you win her first? Because she won she was ninety four. Oh, uh, whatever oh, year that, that was. That was the first. Yeah, I remember that. And uh, I took her up on stage. I, I, I. My job was to make sure she didn't fall down all the entire ceremony. I, I had a vice grip on her arm. I had to do it like down here because June was like, yeah, you know, she's munchkin petite, size, petite woman. And uh, I walked her up on stage twice, once to present and once to accept, mm. and then marched her around. And I was so proud that I got to take June to this great moment in her life where the whole the whole TV industry is is 
giving her standing ovations and lining up to tell her how wonderful she was. Oh, that's so amazing. And, she and, was yeah, quite the force. And she was the last one of that breed. There, there are no more voice actors who were in the business that long. Mm -hmm. I, and I got to work with Stan Freeberg a lot too. Mm -hmm. Stan Freeberg did his first cartoon voice uh, in 19, I don't remember the exact year, but he did his last cartoon voice job on my one of my sh TV sh shows. I directed him 70 years after he did his first job. Oh my goodness. He was like 16 when he did his first job. Wow. And, and, he's, and so, how many people in this world do, are doing the same thing 70 years later? So let me ask you then, Mark, do you have a biography? Autobiography. Um, my blog is my autobiography. Uh -huh. I just do it. I do it a day at a time. And for our viewers that might, you know, some of the younger oh. viewers that might not be familiar, can you tell us where we can find it's that? It's www.newsfromme. N e w s f r o m m e. Me or my initials. And uh, I am just about. By the time this show is on the internet, yep. I will have done my thirty thousandth post on that blog. What? Yes. So you can see I have a lot of free time. <laughs> yeah, you might as well put that into a book. It makes, you know, makes Maybe. You cash. <laughs> um, so uh, speaking of history and, and rich, rich culture, let's talk about Comic-Con 1970. Set the scene for us. What was that like? Well, with the first Comic-Con, they had, they say they had 300 people there over the three days. I thought mm -hmm. it was a little more than that, but not much more. It was in the basement of the U.S. Grant Hotel, <laughs> which you can still stay in that. You can still stay in that basement, in fact, in San Diego. Uh -huh. The hotel's still there. And we thought that was incredible. We were just running around going, my God, there's 300 people here. And now there's you know, 300 people ahead of you in line to buy a diet Snapple. Uh, oh, it's, wow. We've seen the thing grow and grow and grow and yeah. grow. And I've just been there every year because I love the convention. My reasons for loving it have changed over the years. Um, I miss the intimacy. I miss the chance to meet people who, whose work I grew up on. Mm -hmm. They're all gone now. Oh. But it's just exciting to be there. It's exciting for the same reason it's exciting to go to Disneyland. You're surrounded by so many happy people. <laughs> and there's, you're surrounded by so many creative people. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you look in that convention hall. Somebody has written something or made something or designed something. Someone's built a costume. Someone's made a sculpture. It's just, it, it's invigorating to be around so many creative people. Yeah, it is. Wow. So 70, 19, so we're saying it was 50 years, correct my math. Was it 50 years in 2020? I didn't know there'd be math in this text here. Uh, the first 70, one was, 80, 90, first 90, was 1970. 2000, 2010, we lost two years to, so, to, to, to COVID. Right. So we can't count those. So actually, this is kind of the 50th year anniversary, um, right? 2020 like would have been 50 years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we lost 2020 and 2021. So I guess that is. Yeah. Well, I've been to all of them. So. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they're exciting. They're fun. And. Yeah. Uh, um, what do you, I mean, what changes are, have you been more excited to embrace? Well, you know, one of the things that has changed is, the, and, and this is, some people will tell you this is not for the better, is it used to be about comic books mm -hmm. and comic strips. But there was always an element of science fiction and, mm -hmm. mo, uh, and a major motion pictures there. At the second or third one, I met, had lunch with Frank Capra, one of the greatest directors of all time. He okay. was there. Oh. Uh, so it's not news that there's, things other than comics there, but the focus has shifted. But then this focus in the comic industry has shifted. Yeah. DC Comics and Marvel Comics are not comic book companies anymore. They're media companies, parts of conglomerates that produce movies and TV shows. And so the convention has changed along with the industry. And uh, there's some people who rebel against it because they like things to be the way they were when they were 14 years old. But if you accept that, that the world changes and you know, you change with it or you mm -hmm. get left behind. Uh, it's very invigorating. And the definition of comics has expanded. Mm. Comics now are movies. Comics now are video games. Comics now are dressing up as interesting costumes I and wandering was, yeah. around. Yeah. I, I think that's uh, interesting. The culture has shifted. Uh, what year did you start seeing people 
come to Comic Con in costume? Oh, well, I, the first couple of years there were costumes. Uh huh. Uh, there, but it was like never Batman or well, yeah, yeah. Somebody was always in around in a superhero suit. Uh-huh. That's 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 very primal. <laughs> what what is different now is the amount of effort and expense that people go to, uh-huh. and the fact that some of those people who are wandering around in costumes get themselves jobs. They get hired for movies. They get hired for personal appearances. They get hired to design somebody else's costumes or, or replicate them. Um, it, it's a it's a it's a place that changes lives often. Mm. And um, you know, I've been doing the cartoon voice panel for a long time. We actually have gotten to the point where there are people who came to the cartoon voice panel as amateurs and beginners who wanted to get into the yes. industry, and now they're on the cartoon voice panel. Caitlin Robrock. Caitlin Robrock, that's, that's right. A good example. She's been on the show. She's she's a wonderful talent. Mm-hmm. Um, and Caitlin Robrock, who of course is the voice of Minnie Mouse. That's right. Yes. Uh, best known as Minnie Mouse. I did a I did a podcast, a video podcast with her, and everybody knew she was the voice of Minnie Mouse, but we weren't allowed to announce it yet. <laughs> she just oh, she had just gotten the part, part, so we're all talking around it mm. and such because that's a major coup to to land that part mm-hmm. and to inherit uh, the dynasty the that goes sh- with it. Those are big shoes to fill. Very much. And they have large bows on them. Large bows. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you, got, you got there before I did. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so that's a big change that has happened to Comic-Con. Um, the fact that you get to meet the people who are in the new movie. I, I, as I mentioned, I apprenticed with this man, Jack Kirby. He was his assistant for a while. Tell us. For he some, was, those of our Jack readers. Kirby was the most creative person who ever worked in the comic book industry. He might be the most creative person who ever worked on this planet. He invented characters, he designed things. The the whole shorthand of superhero comics is built mm-hmm. largely around his visions. He was a lovely man, he was very creative, he was wonderful towards beginners and new talent, and he also had this way of predicting the future uh, through wisdom, not through psychic powers. <laughs> and at one of the earliest San Diego cons, when it was like 3,000 people, we thought that was a, as big as it could get, he said, the day is going to come when we're going to take over this city. The whole city will revolve around Comic-Con, and this will be where Hollywood comes to sell the movies they made last year and to find out what they're going to make next year. That is very close to a verbatim quote uttered around 1974. Wow. And we watched that. Be- and, and with Jack, you know, I learned this mostly in hindsight, you, you, he'd say something like that and you go, yeah, sure, Jack. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. That'll happen. And then it would. Mm. He was right way more often. A visionary. Yeah, he, he was a, truly a visionary. And he was a guy who people thought, oh, he's a comic book artist. No, he was a visionary. He He saw ideas. He had concepts. The fact that he drew real well was a very small part of what he was. Mm. And he was the first person to signal out the Comic-Con. He was the guest of honor at the first one. Oh, and wow. he came to everyone he could as long as his health would permit until he passed away. And there's still a void there. But if you go around that dealer's room, that big exhibit hall, you see him everywhere. Mm-hmm. Not only do you see people dressed as characters he created or co-created, or you see posters, you see, and you see his style. It, 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 it is in, everything is infused with Kirby where you look, I just go there and I'm reminded of Jack. Every time I turn around, there's someone who was inspired by him. I tell people, if he wasn't your favorite comic book artist, he was probably your favorite comic book artist, favorite comic book artist. <laughs> wow. And, and he, he is one of the many people who were involved in making the convention mm-hmm. grow and expand and get bigger and bigger to the point where... We do take over the city. We have the biggest convention space that the city can come up with, mm-hmm. and we take over all the other spaces around it, all yeah. the other hotels, and just try to get a reservation. <laughs> and you do some of the big panels there, Quick Draw, yeah, and then, of course, Cartoon Voices, yes. which is usually yeah. in room A. That I uh, believe cartoon Voices is sometimes people. in 6A and sometimes in 6BCF. Okay. We jumped back and forth between the two biggest rooms upstairs. Uh huh. How did you get started um, hosting that panel? I just had the idea that people would like to meet cartoon voices. I was directing cartoon voices. What year was this? I think I, I think it's. I think we're now on like twenty years. We've been doing it. Okay. Uh, roughly. It's like two thousand. Uh, and one day. I thought it'd be nice. This, the convention said you can do any kind of panel you want. So I said I'd like to bring a bunch of cartoon voice actors down. This is when you couldn't see almost all every voice actor in the business wandering the hall. 
So that year, I asked my friends uh, Rob Paulson, Maurice LaMarche, Greg Berger, and Joe Alasky Aww. to come down. And they gave us a room that I think seated 400 people, and we turned away about 700 or 800 people. Wow. So the next year, they gave me a larger room, and we turned away 700 or 800 people. And the next year, they gave me a larger room. And we're up to the point now where, where we turn away 700, 800 people in the, from the largest room they can give us. Wow. So, but it became a, uh, an event. And uh, now, cart- I'm not claiming credit for this, but now cartoon voice actors are a major part of it. not just Comic-Con, but every convention. Yeah. You probably get a lot of offers to go to different conventions and sign pictures of yourself. Hey, and, and I wish there was more. Universe. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me? It's, and it's, and, and this is what is different from being a comic fan or a cartoon fan. When I grew up, when I was, you know, 14, 10, 12, watching cartoons mm-hmm. I loved, there was no way I could go meet Dawes Butler or Mel Blanc or any of those people. Now, Until you worked with them. Until until I would, <laughs> until like... I hired them. <laughs> you know? uh, actually, I got I got to meet Dawes before I hired him. He was a lovely man. He was just uh, you will not find a single voice actor who ever was around Dawes Butler who will not punch you out if you say a bad word about him. He was the nicest, yeah. Yeah. sweetest man, the most creative person. June was like that too. Um, generally speaking, cartoon voice actors are very nice people. It There's very few exceptions, and. Even though they are in, on some level theoretically competitors, you'd be amazed. Well, you wouldn't be amazed by this, but people would be amazed by the number of times I will call a voice actor. I say, I want to book you for this show. And he'll say, listen, I got a friend who needs to make his SAG health insurance. Or it's just, I know some guy who does that kind of thing better than I do. Why don't you, why don't you call him? Mm. They don't, people don't give away on camera parts. <laughs> they will recommend each other. for. And I'm sure you've been in sessions where somebody has said, hey, listen, Allison might do this better than, why don't you give her a shot at this part? Because she does that kind of thing better than I do. Oh, it's been a while since many of us have been in a group session. (laughs) How has the pandemic been affecting you and the way that you work? Well, I haven't directed a cartoon Mm -hmm. show uh, that way Mm -hmm. yet. We were, I was insisting on getting everybody in the same room, um, which frustrated people who wanted to work remotely on the show. but I liked having everybody there. And somebody would call me up and say, hey, listen, can I be on your show? I'm in Cleveland. Could, I, could you patch me in and make you play a part in your show? And I'd say, I've got Frank Welker coming into the studio. If Frank Welker is going to be in the <laughs> studio, I'm not, I'm not going to do you remotely. Yeah. So um, I haven't had the experience yet of directing a, sh- a show that way. And the studio that I use for most of my recording sessions has gone out of business. Oh, uh, which on, one was that? Uh, be Buzzies over oh, on Melrose. Buzzies. Oh, Buzzies. Yes. Wow. And, uh, uh, you know, and it, it was a, it, the history there was incredible. Uh, one of the things that was, I found out, you know, when you're doing a show in a, in a recording studio, they're running backups all the time to make yeah. sure they don't lose anything. I was not aware, all the years I worked there, I probably did 25 years of shows at Buzzies, that they were running a backup on everything. Just a back, of, a back of them, and they kept them, and they're oh, giving wow. them to me. They're on on hard disks, and so I've got going to be getting when I get the whole thing. I'm going to be getting seven hours of me directing Jonathan Winters, oh, and six wow. hours of me directing James Earl Jones, and four hours of me, wow. and and a thousand hours of Frank Welker making feedback sounds and doing creature <laughs> voices and stuff in between takes. Oh, you'll uh, have to share some of that. It's, it's uh, stunning. The, the talent you have in there, because as you know, um, most sessions tap 10% of what you can do. Mm, you, know, you, you go yeah. into a session and you're doing two characters or three characters and you can do 80. So those other characters, those other sounds leak out in between and people, or people try things different ways. You ever work with Corey Burton? And I haven't, well, no. Co- I, we were doing a, uh, a Garfield show and Corey does every single actor who was ever a great narrator uh-huh. and i just went him made him to go through every one of his voices he read the copy we had a, a bunch of lines of copy and he i had said okay read this as hans Conry. now read this as paul freeze now read this as uh jackson beck now read wow. this as bill woodson now read this all these great announcers of the past yeah. read this as norman rose because once you know all these great voice actors of history 
um, you know, it's a it's a shorthand language. Yeah. I could say to I could say to a, an actor, give it a little more Gary Owens, and they know what mm. I mean. Yeah, Gary had a very distinctive. The Gary's a guy I worked with a lot too. Lovely man. Uh, let's talk about uh, Garfield. Okay, you've been with Garfield for a long time. Yes, tell about the couple different incarnations of well, the Gartman. Garfield. Uh, what happened was that that um, there's this thing called TVQ. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's no. they do these surveys and it. It surveys the public and it kind of says, uh, to answer two questions, what celebrities, what stars, what characters are you most familiar with and which ones do you have a positive feeling for? Mm. And <laughs> one year, the among cartoon characters, the most popular character that wasn't encumbered already on a cartoon show was Garfield, Jim Davis's character. They yeah. were doing primetime specials of Garfield. Loved Garfield. And, uh, CBS went to Jim and said, we want Garfield for Saturday morning. And Jim said, well, I don't know because I can't write. This is Jim now talking. I can't write a show every week. He had written the primetime specials and each one of those took him six or eight months. Mm -hmm. And he said, I just, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think anybody else can write Garfield the way I want it written. Um, so no. And the, Produce, the head of CBS Children's Programming, a lovely lady named Judy Price, said, if I can find a writer you trust, will you let us do a Garfield Saturday morning show? And Jim went, okay. So Judy called me in. I had just uh, been working on her with her <laughs> for her on a show that never got in the air. It was a Michael Jackson cartoon show. We were, we were, doing a, we were <laughs> wow. going to do a show. What was it called? It was called Michael's Pets. It was about the animals. <laughs> That Michael had in his in his menagerie. Okay, and wow. I had to go Michael's out and meet with Michael Jackson. Oh my god! This is back when there was a Michael Jackson, and his image was a little cleaner than it came <laughs> later. And the show just—I thought the show wasn't working right. I didn't mm. like the show that was developing. I so I moonwalked off it, <laughs> and uh, I owed CBS a script. And, and they, uh -huh. I said, I'll give back the money. They said, Well, why don't you write a Garfield pilot for us instead? And I went. Okay, sure. So I wrote the Garfield pilot. They sent it to Jim Davis, and he called me up and he said, "Okay, let's do a show." And we did this show, and it was more fun than anything I've ever worked on in my life. Oh, uh, they let me just do whatever I that wanted. That was the '80s version. That was the '80s version called Garfield and Friends. I remember that show. My sister and I loved and that show. We did 121 half hours of it, of which I wrote 121. Oh with the help of one other writer who helped me on, on some of the episodes. Wow, that's but, so prolific. And well, Jim didn't want anybody else writing it. I actually had a lot of writers who were very angry at me. They couldn't get work on the show. Mm. But that was the deal. They, they, mm. we, Jim would, re, would, would renew the contract every year if I signed to write them all. So I wrote them all. Mm -hmm. And they let me do whatever I wanted. The network did not have approvals. The network was so... Eager to have Garfield, they they agreed to not see the scripts in advance. So would Jim have approval? Jim would have approval, and and after the first dozen or so, he stops. He says, ah, "Don't send it to me, Mark. Just just do them." So I just wrote whatever I wanted, and I cast whoever I wanted, and the show was their number one show for seven years. Wow! High five. <laughs> yeah, it's the, yeah, I mean, I mean, and I'm not suggesting that a lot of writers and other producers couldn't do that. I think that there that cartoon shows like most of television gets micromanaged. Mm. You got to let the creative people do what they do best. And you know, you as as we've learned in directing cartoon voices, um if you hire the right people, you just say, "Okay, there's your microphone, you're playing girl number 3 and 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 Fred, and <laughs> just go do whatever you want and then we'll correct you later mm -hmm. if there's a problem." But um you know, look at the actors we had on some of those shows. I, I'm I'm going to give Lorenzo Music direction on how to deliver a line. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we had Greg Berger and a fellow named Tom Hughey was the original John on the show, and and I got to hire anybody I wanted. Yeah. You know, the trick is you hire the right people. And you know, if we had Lorenzo Music was the voice of Garfield in the first series, I'm not going to tell Lorenzo how to deliver a line. <laughs> it, was, it was brilliant. He was Lorenzo Music because. He didn't need direction. Uh, I find if you give, have to give the actors a lot of direction, you've hired the wrong actors. If you've hired the wrong actors, mm -hmm. you're not a very good director. But it's interesting because 
it's also about like working together to create this safe space where you can do your best work. And when you have this put, you know, this rapport with your director, then it's like you feel free to try the bits or the improv or just the delivery that makes magic that's so connected when you you guys can all be fully focused on delivering the message in the moment. You know, it's how do we get there? Yeah, yeah. You know? No, I mean you you it's a very wonderful process. Sometimes I will hear I have an actor to read a line and it's nothing like what I heard in my head when mm -hmm. I wrote it. And I'll go, hey, that's better. That's mm -hmm. interesting. And a couple of times I've stopped sessions and said, hold on, let me rewrite. You had what you did, I think I want to do more. We had we had a uh a session one time. Stan Freeberg was playing a character. Um and he decided to give the character a little bit of a lisp, a tiny little, mm -hmm. very soft, like Sylvester the cat yeah. has, a little tiny lisp. And it was really good. So I stopped the session. I told everybody to go out and have coffee. And I rewrote the rest of the script and put S's in all his speeches to oh, make, to make, that's uh, funny. take advantage of it. Oh, that's great. Uh, <laughs> and Stan Freeberg was a boyhood hero of mine. Oh. If anybody watching this doesn't know who he is, if you're interested in cartoon voices, you should know who Stan Freeberg was. Uh, it was a brilliant, brilliant man. I, and probably now with YouTube, yeah. people can do research. Yeah, to find some of Stan Freeberg there. basically invented the funny commercial, mm -hmm. and he was a voice guy for Disney. And he was he was the he was the Beaver and Lady and the Tramp. Mm -hmm. uh, he was in. He did the voice of Mickey Mouse a couple of times, brief, briefly. And he was the other guy in a lot of the Warner Brothers cartoons. You know, besides Mel Blanc, Mel got the sole credit, but. You know, when they had the two gophers, one of them was Mel and one of them was Stan. Mm -hmm. When you had the two, uh, um, what was the other? Uh, the two mice, Hubie and Bertie. One of them was Mel and one of them was Stan. Wow. And uh, uh, just an amazing, talented man. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's enormous talent in the business. In fact, right now in the cartoon business, there's probably too much. There's probably <laughs> too many good people for the number of job openings there are. Mm -hmm. And there are more job openings than there ever were. Yeah. But, but people... They're Pop multiplying. Kill them. Yeah. <laughs> so I know I had read that um, Grew the Wanderer is um, currently being developed. And I was wondering, I don't know where you're at in the process, if you can share a little bit about how you got involved with the project. And Well, I don't know where we are in the process either. Uh, <laughs> Grew is a comic book that I've been doing for 40 years with my best friend, who's mm -hmm. a man named Sergio Aragonis, who has been drawing. Is he from LA? He is from well, he's from Spain and Mexico. Oh, okay. He grew, born in Spain, grew up in Mexico, and he came to America in the 60s and began drawing for Mad Magazine. And oh. he drew for Mad until, well, he's still drawing for Mad. Mad is mostly reprint these days, but whatever is new in the magazine is his little drawings in the margins. Oh, wow. Which he does. And he's uh, an amazing, you know, I know I'm gushing about all these people, but they're highly gushable. <laughs> um, and Sergio is my best buddy, and he came up with the idea for this comic book about an inept barbarian who usually slays the, the not only slays the dragon, but the the the, the maiden, the, the maiden he's there to rescue, <laughs> uh, the stupidest barbarian on the planet. Uh -huh. And we've now been doing it for forty years, mm -hmm. and we've made a deal with a company that is developing it as a cartoon series. And I'm not being evasive when I tell you I'm not sure where we are in the process right yeah. now. As, it, as it, things it's in off, development. It's on, it's off. We're yeah. going to do this. We're going to do that. It's, you know, it, you, you learn in this business. Uh, I'll tell you something interesting, which is that one of the reasons I like writing comic books is that you go to a publisher. You say, hey, this is the book I want to do. And they go, okay, fine. Get the, get the first issue in. And then you and an artist or two, and there's three people involved. And you just do the comic and it comes out. Mm -hmm more or less the way you want. You do a TV show and you're letting yourself in for seven months of meetings and, <laughs> and conference calls and now they're on Zoom. So you're, you're sitting there in your underwear from the waist down <laughs> and discussing, uh, you know, pitching this here and foreign syndication. And oh, it, it's wow. a much more complicated process. Mm -hmm. And there are upsides to that too. I, I used to love writing variety shows because you're working with real people. I'd write a song and human beings would actually sing it, you know. But there's something great about something that's produced by two people or three people mm. also. So sure. there's a simplicity in doing the comic book that is not present in doing a cartoon show yeah. because the cartoon show, of, you know, may cost millions of dollars to make. It doesn't cost millions of dollars to do one comic book. Yeah. 
lower barrier to entry. Yeah. Well, Mark, I feel like we could chat all day, but it's time for us to wrap it up. I just was wondering, um, so San Diego Comic-Con, we'll see you. Can you announce anything about what panels you'll be hosting? Uh, at the moment, the plan is to go back to doing the two cartoon voice panels on Saturday and Sunday. Uh -huh. uh, I'm going to see if I can get some of the best people. I'm going to see if I can get this Allison Packard lady to be on one of them, but hey, she's, uh, she's, kinda, she's kinda busy. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to do the quick draw game with Sergio, what we do. I'm going to do my panel, my annual tribute to Jack Kirby panel, which we do because otherwise I just spend the whole convention talking about Jack anyway. <laughs> um, and we're going to do... Maybe his a ghost panel. will appear. Uh, I'm going to do a panel about a, a book I'm involved with editing. I'm supervising the reprints of what I think was the greatest newspaper strip ever done, which was Pogo by a man named okay. Walt Kelly. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful comic strip. I think it was the best thing ever in the mm. syndication strip. And we're reprinting all of them now. And we're doing a panel about that. Um, and I don't know what else I'm going to do. I'll just, yeah. I do the panels that aren't really to try to sell you anything. Mm. Uh, you know, a lot of the panels at San Diego have turned into infomercials or this new movie or this new series or whatever. And I like the cartoon voice panels because we're not selling a show. We're selling, look at these brilliantly talented people. We're just entertaining, we're right? Just entertaining. We're just, well, you know, it's, it's fun. amazing to watch the audience when they hear. Uh, I do this quick draw panel where we have these super fast cartoonists, including Sergio and my buddy Scott Shaw, drawing mm -hmm. for people. And I'm wandering around the audience getting suggestions what they should draw. And I look at people's faces. And I see this amazement. They go like, I can't believe I just saw someone draw that in five seconds. And then we do the cartoon voice panel. Mm. And I'm just looking at the audience. I'm on stage for that. But they go... I don't how did that person just sound like a like a donkey. How did that person just sound like like Meryl Streep? Yeah. How did you know the the the, the it's, it's the same away. look, and it's the same look I see. I'm a member of the Magic Castle, and I go there and I see magicians making people levitate and sawing them in half, and it's the same look. It's yeah. these people going, and I'm not just I'm not I didn't just see that. Yeah. So you it's know, magic. You, you, you bring wonderment to people. Wonder and, and awe. you because these. There's something these things all have in common. The fast cartoonists, the brilliant voice actors, the amazing magicians. They're just doing things that you would not think a human being could do. It would be really fun to combine them, to have like voice actors at the quick draw. And then after he draws them, then they have to provide we, we, a voice. We should, have we, you tried we, we that? We try that a little bit. Yeah, we should do more of that. Um, it would be fun. Yeah. Um, maybe you come down and we'll, we'll, we'll design a character in front of everybody and you can give her a voice. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. It sounds so fun. Yeah. So it's, um, no, it's, it's, uh, th this is the reason I love Comic-Con. It is this yeah. festival of creativity and talent everywhere you mm -hmm. look. And, you know, there's so much that I can't do that I'm not able to do. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I've occasionally cast myself in a, in a voice job. And I've seen that on IMDb, and, 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 but I haven't and, heard. And, that's, and I'm pretty terrible at it. I'm not, <laughs> and, I'm think, and I think, why did I do that? Because, you know. You got a good voice. Greg Berger is standing over there. Neil Ross is, is out in the waiting mm -hmm. room. Why am I doing this voice? Yeah. Uh, Jim Davis made me do it a couple of times. Um, and, uh, uh, but I'm a really fan of, fan of people who can do amazing things, of magicians and cartoonists mm -hmm. and such. And it's nice to be able to present them to the world and yeah. And show them off. Reveal what's behind the curtain of of the magic, as well, it were. Well, you know, it's it's we we, we live for wonderment. That's mm -hmm. the that's the common thread in everything at Comic Con. One hundred percent. Yes. So yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your rich history and all that your wise years and perspective. I don't think there's <laughs> anyone else that could grace us with such insight and wisdom. So thank you except, so much. Except whoever you have on this show next week or the week after. <laughs> or, the week after. or those other five guys yeah, that were at the right. first Comic-Con. Yeah, yeah, I want to meet them yes. this year. <laughs> Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you we'll see you me. next time. Guys, if you like what you saw, please go ahead and click the subscribe button because we're doing these every week. And we, I want to know what other guests you want to hear. So drop them in the comments and we'll see you next week. Bye.